What is up, football fans? Welcome to Live from the 55. Guys, we're here in our Marta Loop, Calgary, Alberta Studios, the Nation Network. It's good to be here. I'm Danny Austin. We got a fun show. We got Ted Wyman. Let's see how that went. We recorded it. We had a couple little audio issues. Not Ted's fault, but not our fault either. Just the fault of, of living in the world in the year 2023. And we had Dave McIver, actually, first time on, which is wild. He's a Calgary guy. He's hosts on 770, do his show all the time, do a little pregame segment with him as well. So it was super kind. Talked to a little Stan Peters, even though it's the middle of the bye week. Tad, we focused as much as we could on BC and Winnipeg playing. Big game of the week. We're obviously going to talk about that a little bit in the intro. But here we are, guys. It is week 17, I do believe. I should know that. Before we go any further, do you want to give a shout out to the absolute legend, Saskatchewan Rough Riders? You know, we're talking about George Reed, passed away this week. Uh, one of the all time greats in the CFL. Not a guy I've met or anything like that, but just a guy I've always admired from afar. Uh, obviously, Hall of Famer on every level and just a, an important piece of Canadian football history. So, I just want to quickly, before we went any further, um, shout out George Reed, guy who. You know, it's inspired generations of football players in Saskatchewan and around the country, and is an all-time great. There's lots of great pieces of on him. I'm not going to sit here and try to get emotional about it and, and do anything, but definitely go check it out. There's good stuff on Three Down. There's good stuff on CBC. There's good stuff um, certainly in the Regina Leader Post. Yeah, you know, don't want to go any further without acknowledging an absolute legend of the Canadian game. Beyond that, yeah, guys, we got a kind of fun. Uh, do we have a fun week? Yeah, we have a fun week. This isn't like the world's greatest weekend of CFL football, but it happens to feature the biggest game of the year between the Bombers and Lions. Both teams tied, sitting atop the West Division. We tried to hype up. If anyone listens to this podcast regularly, you know I spent like a significant amount of time talking about how we needed to hype up the Bombers and Argos last weekend, and then the Argos just decided they didn't really care about that game, so it ended up being all for naught. A little bit uh, disappointing there, but no disappointment this week. This one's a huge one. Base game of the year. Two absolutely fantastic football teams. You know, I think that there are three contenders for the Grey Cup. Uh, maybe four. I do like the Alouettes coming up there a little bit behind, and maybe even five because I don't hate the Thai Cats. But look, the front runners, after I just did that disaster of a sentence, are obviously the Argos number one with the, the Bombers and Lions. And we finally see them facing off in a big competitive game with everything on the line. It's what we do this for. Um, who do I give the edge to? I give it to the Lions. They're at home. I like Dominic Grimes. I think Vernon Adams Jr. is absolutely in contention for CFL MOP. I will say I think that uh, J.C. Abbott over in three down. Go read it. I don't agree with everything J.C. wrote about why Vernon's should be sort of the MOP front runner. Um, I very much have Chad Kelly as the MOP front runner, and I'm not going to hold it against Chad Kelly that you know the Argos haven't necessarily needed him to. Go big and throw for 400 yards all the time. But he's, uh, look, Vernon is, it's, it's Vernon or Zach. That's what it's going to be in the West Division. We can we can argue all we want. And there are people who say, oh, it shouldn't just be the quarterback from the best team. I agree. But you got to do something special. I think Brady Oliveira has done a lot of really cool stuff. Um, but, you know, it's, guys, it's Zach Aleros. He's He's won MLP. He's, he's been the best player in our league. And then I think it's Vernon Adams who has truly emerged after years of, of sort of doubt and people questioning him. I think Vernon Adams has stepped up his game in a real way this year. Uh, I think people put way too much stock in that Toronto game. We had Farhan on probably about two months ago, Farhan Lajee from TSN. And he was just like, ever there's this narrative about Vernon that he's inconsistent, that he just can't seem to shake. Like people won't give him credit. And I think that that is true. And it's amazing to see him now getting credit. And I think JC did a, a really terrific job um, kind of laying out the case for Vernon. Um, and I don't have to agree with everything to think that he made. A, a really strong case. So um, I say this to both Ted and and to McIver. Um, I say, like, look, man, this game, the team that finishes the West, I will likely have their quarterback as sort of the front runner. There are going to be other factors that come into play, but I don't think that there's been a tremendous amount of separation between Caleros and Vernon Adams Jr. So, you know, finishing finishing atop, atop the West, you likely are the front runner for my vote. Um, I don't really know if you go around the rest of the West right now, like, this is clearly not a candidate in Saskatchewan. I imagine, this is off the top of my head, I honestly haven't thought about this, but I think Reggie Bagleton is going to get my vote for MOP out of Calgary, but he's not a legitimate 
he's not going to be a legitimate contender to knock off Fernand or whatever. Edmonton, like, is it Trey Ford? He didn't really play enough games. He's not going to get any real consideration, but eh, I should have Jerry Motorjong on ask him who his MOP vote for Edmonton is. Probably got to be Trey Ford. Probably, no, it probably can't. I don't know. Wish I hadn't started this discussion with myself on air because it makes me look like I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I just don't think that much about who the Edmonton Elks MOP is, guys. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, look, winner of that game, man. They're the front runners to host the West final. I think the team that hosts the West final is going to have a big advantage. Um, they always do, but this year in particular, if you're Vancouver, you love playing indoors, not having to go to Winnipeg. If you're Winnipeg, you love dragging the Lions out into that cold prairie tundra for a November game. So big game, big, big, big game. I can't wait for this one. Um, the battle in the trenches is going to be fascinating. We know what that Lions D-line can do. We know there have been questions about the Bombers O-line. Love that matchup. You know, there's just so much talent that's going to be on the field. Um, I'd luck. ideally like to have three or four games throughout the season that feel this big, but it's nice that we're having one. Um, otherwise, it's what? It's the Argos. It's the 150th anniversary. Um, the Edmonton Elks. This doesn't feel like it's going to be a great game. Um, but at the same time, Edmonton surprised a lot of people over the last month and a half. And who knows? It's just it's at home in Toronto. It's technically probably the best team in the league against what some might argue is the worst, although I'm not sure we're all making that argument anymore. Um, but, you know, the Argos should slaughter them. I'm assuming that the Argos, given that this is a huge occasion, big party, big celebration of their history, are going to actually start all their players. Um, I think it matters if you're going to try to drag the fans out, put on a show. Anything less, I'm going to be really, really disappointed. But, yeah. Anyways, Elks, Argos, have fun with that, guys. Um, yeah, then Hamilton, Saskatchewan. Hamilton, are, are they for real? We see them climbing. We see them. People were writing them off. People were saying they didn't believe. It was all a disaster. No one believes in the Thai Cats, and now all of a sudden, they're lingering. Yeah, they're in third place in the East, but they're only one game back of the Alouettes. They got that great cup at home. Apparently, Bo Levi Mitchell, like, that really caught me off guard. The Thai Cats, Matthew Schultz and Bo Levi Mitchell are splitting starters reps this week. It implies that Bo is close, and we hadn't heard anything really about Bo. So that is going to be... Just such a fascinating storyline to watch because I don't know that it's not like Matthew Schultz has, has lit the world on fire, but I, I did like what Powell was doing there. And now Bo's back. And it, it seems if they're splitting, splitting starters reps, that it is a priority to get him ramped up and ready to play. So, um, man, Bo coming back. Let's say the Ticats catch the Alouettes, move into second place. They get a home game in the East final, East semifinal. I apologize with Bo Levi Mitchell, a guy who's won a lot of playoff games in there. So he's rested, cuts out a couple of those mental errors we saw earlier in the season. I don't know, man. That could be a cool storyline. And I don't know. I don't know. That how can you pick against the Argos? I'm not. I'm trying to talk myself into it, but I can't. Speaking of the Argos, they signed Richardson Danny. Guy I spent a lot of time covering here in Calgary. Guy I had a lot of time for. I know that this one doesn't really look like it's going to move the needle. 12 catches for 90 yards. So it's not like he's having some sort of massive season. It's not like anyone's going to lose their minds over this. But I do think it's one of those signings where you kind of look at it and K. Richards. Sandani knows Ryan Dinwiddie because he used to be with the Stamps. He knows Argos receivers coach Pete Costanza he used to be with the Stamps. They know what they're getting in him. They're getting him in a leap blocker, a guy who's incredibly intelligent, knows the game, uh, can come up with big catches when you need it. It just wouldn't surprise me if Sandani's a guy who, you know, maybe has something to say between now and the end of the season about, about the way the Argos year goes. Um, so, anyways, yeah, lots to talk about. There's... I did talk about all the games, right? No, I didn't. <laughs> Ottawa, Montreal. It's Ottawa. Montreal's going to win this game. They're at home. Montreal, again, a lot, lot better than people are giving them credit for. Um, that's all I got to say about that, guys. Like, I, I kind of prepared to be finished my intro before I started that sentence. So um, we got Ted Wyman. We're going to see how this goes. We did record this earlier. We we There were just some a few connectivity issues, so um, we may... You know, cut this together a little bit, but Ted's the best. He is literally uh, a good friend of mine and one of the guys I love having on. So we're definitely, he was really interesting and want to get what we can up there. And then Dave McIver, um, you guys know us, you know who we love. We love Muggs Pub. Um, we love Fraser and Fig. Let's get to it, guys. Cheers. Guys, let's say you're having a party. Let's say you're having a picnic. Let's say you're having any occasion. We got to talk to you about Fraser and Fig. 
So I love these guys here in Martin Loop, a couple storefronts down from our studio here. Fraser and Fig, man, these guys do these delicious elevated cheese and charcuterie boxes. You know, they're made with all these fresh artisanal ingredients, on-demand grazing, pickup, delivery. You got it. Just let them know what you want. They will get it to you. Honestly, I'm such a big fan. I had a picnic a little while ago. I brought one of their curated boxes and it was a huge hit. I looked great. People loved it. We're hungry. They weren't hungry anymore. These ready to go boxes, they got them in four sizes. All their boxes come with meat, cheese, dried fruit, fresh fruit, nuts, olives, pickles, and carrots. Their selections vary from month to month. Choices are always new. You know, just because they've had one doesn't mean you've had them all. I love Fraser and Fig. I love having them as a sponsor. They're the best. Make sure you check them out. Tell them by from the 55 sent you. All right. As promised, my friend, your friend, Ted Wyman from the Winnipeg Sun. Best in the business, buddy. How you doing? Well, that's awfully nice praise, Danny. I don't know if that's true, but I will certainly uh, take the compliment, and I am doing great. It's great to see you. Always fun to talk some CFL. Perfect. Well, so let's like lay the groundwork here. You literally just got back from Bombers media yeah. availability. Um, obviously, like, look, we're we're talking about about BC Winnipeg. I wanted to do to blow up Winnipeg Toronto last weekend, and then the Argos decided not to cooperate and not <laughs> yes. to make that game be sort of the blockbuster but but i mean this one has that feel like you're seeing you know jc abbott in in vancouver talking about how vernon needs to be the mop or you know like this has that feeling of like okay this is october football like let's go right absolutely it really does and i mean even though it's going to be played in a controlled environment in bc place it is kind of that what the cfl is all about late in the year the leaves are starting to fly. The temperatures are getting a little colder. And that's when these really important football games take place. And then with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and the BC Lions, I just, I can't think of a more important regular season game, certainly involved in the last five years. It, this one means so much. It's a playoff game in the regular season. There's just no other way to look at it. Basically in the race for first place, most likely going to host the West final. That's a huge, you know, and, and and in some ways, I think it's even bigger. For, you know, the Bombers don't hate the idea of going to BC to play the West Final. They, they'd prefer to play it at home, but they don't hate, like, nobody minds playing in that controlled environment. There's just way more of a challenge, I think, in November. So um, this is just a, a game. A lot. And unlike last week against Toronto, the... Uh, their best yes okay i'm having a little bit of an audio issue here so um i do i believe what you you said there at the end was that like ultimately the bombers are okay with going to vancouver like let's be real here they're not gonna they're not overly upset about and i mean I, the stampeders sort of had that thing last year for the west semifinal, and then it completely blew up in their faces because they didn't play very well and nathan work was an absolute stud but i mean it, it's basic like look if it's that time of the year man, playing in, in cold temperatures is hard on the body. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that point, I think that this matters more for the Lions. For the Lions. It just does. Um, but do the Bombers, like, are they acknowledging? I mean, because sometimes, you know, football players like to downplay this stuff a little bit. Are, are the Bombers acknowledging that this is sort of as big a game as it is? Most of them, no. And and I usually even, my, my approach is... You know, I know you guys always, this is just another game, but is it really possible to believe that when there's so much on the line? And most of the guys still work to then some way to say, go 1-0 this week and all that kind of stuff. But the truth is, you know, Zach Caleros was one guy who acknowledged they don't get much bigger than this in the regular season. And it's, it's, um, it, it is, it's so meaningful. There's just so much on the line. And they played one, each other once each each one season. They played twice. Well, Winnipeg won 50 to 14 in the second of those games. BC won 30 to 6 in the first of those games. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I think it's going to be a much closer game. I don't expect a blowout this time on either side, but it could go either way. And the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, I don't believe, have been um an underdog in a meaningful football game in quite some time well they are this time they're down you know minus one and a half for the lions right now uh i just see this as just another bit of intrigue you know the bombers have run away with the west division for a few years now 
somebody is there knocking on the door, potentially going to take it away from them. And I, I imagine the whole CFL is uh, interested in what they might see here. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as I was sort of saying, like, I do think that there is a sense. And it's funny because, you know, normally when a team, when, you, you know, we talk about bomber fatigue, we talk about people being sick of the bombers winning. Like, I can't name a single thing. Like, the bombers don't have, like, a Mike Awe taking four penalties for headshots like they don't have a, a marino like i like the bombers like i actually like everything about them and yet even i who like try to remain neutral i'm like i sort of just think it's more interesting and it's not fair to winnipeg fans but like it's just i find it a little more interesting if the lions win this game well i'm sure uh defensive linemen around the league don't think that pat newfeld and jamarcus hardrick and stanley bryant are such nice guys <laughs> when they're on the field but uh you know, um, you bring up a point about the fact that there's some blue bomber fatigue around the league. The fact is, that's kind of funny to me just because the Bombers did not win a Grey Cup for 29 years. And there's an awful lot of, un, uh, you know, long-suffering fans in Winnipeg who are really relishing this time. And I, I honestly think this is, the window is going to close soon enough, Danny. It's just, there's no doubt about it. And I think the Bombers need to make hay while, the, while the, where there's an opportunity to do so. And, and the Lions are banging on the door. The Argonauts have already bashed through the door and took the Grey Cup away from them last year. They look like they could win again. You know, Winnipeg's time to shine is limited. They want to keep this thing going with this same group, this aging group, until the time. But, you know, it's hard enough even right now in 2023. And I do think one of these three teams is going to win the Grey Cup. I, I sure hope it's one of these three teams, to be honest. The rest of the teams in this league, I don't really think are, would be particularly worthy champions based on their regular season. But it, it really is coming down to them and that uh, West final between the same two teams, most likely. And, and then a, a right to probably play Toronto in the Grey Cup. It's that simple. Yeah. I mean, I think it's been... What's interesting is it's been this way basically since mid-July. We've sort of had these teams circled saying, okay, these are the real true contenders. And and maybe, you know, there's talk about Montreal, you know, coming up a little bit. But, like, guys, like, they beat Calgary and Ottawa. Like, let's let, let's see them beat one of these three teams before we start having that conversation. Um, yeah. Is, like, like I don't I, – I have this argument with myself, to be honest, where – like, look, Winnipeg, there's clearly a slight regression, if only because they were the number one team all last year, and then they're number two or number three. Like, they, they've lost a couple more games this year. Uh, I still, I've said this many times, in a one-game playoff matchup, they're probably, like, in the West, they're certainly the team that I'm most scared of. They, they scare me more than the Lions. But, like, has there been, like, like those losses all f have felt in the moment very just – take them on their own. Like they yeah. haven't, there hasn't necessarily felt like there's been a, a consistent issue that's plaguing this team. And again, we're talking about a team that's tied for first place in the West. So plaguing this team is a, is a bit silly for me to say, yeah. but like, ha like, has there been anything that that sort of felt like a recurring issue that, that needs to be addressed on, on some level? The consistent issue to me, Danny is inconsistency with the Winnipeg blue bombers. They, they just haven't been able to, um, string things together the way that they have in the past. They haven't been as dominant in some games. They've taken their foot off the gas in games. They've seemingly <laughs> taken their foot off the gas in weeks prior to the bye. They have a bye that next week. So, I mean, I can't imagine that'll happen in a game with this magnitude against BC. But in five, four of the last five times the Bombers went into a bye week, they lost. That's they, kind of crazy. It is kind of crazy. And are they dropping some of the guys I've talked to say that, you know, Mike O'Shea has said that there's just dip in something concentration meant some, they're just not in it for uh, the entire game. And, and the result has been losses to Ottawa and Hamilton and Saskatchewan. And I mean, one of those teams is a legitimate playoff team, I guess the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Saskatchewan is going to be lucky to even scrape their way in, even even when you know Ham or when Edmonton and Calgary have such poor records. And finish well out of the playoffs. I mean, a team that's so strong would lose to those teams. They usually 
to be. I think there'll be so much told about who that Blue Bomber team is when they go in and play the Lions this week. Because I, I don't think we learned anything about the Blue Bombers last week, except that, you know, they played a Toronto team that wasn't even really trying to win, and they didn't win by that much. In fact, they weren't even leading until late in the fourth quarter. I didn't really think that that was a particularly, uh, particularly uh, you know, uh, encouraging game for the Bombers because of the way that went. And um, I, I hated the fact that uh, Toronto didn't try to win. I think that was lousy for the league and lousy for the Lions and lousy for everybody, even for the Bombers. But again, this is how the league works. And Toronto had the right to make the decisions they made. And that's what happened. But it would be sure nice if they figured out some things with the schedule so they don't have those kind of situations with really key top teams meeting, great cup combatants meeting so late in the season and having it be meaningless. Yeah, it's an interesting one because this is something that I think a lot of people have brought up and they've said, we'll make it week one. And the reality is why like, I, I mean, I hear you like it's why not do the Grey Cup rematch every single year? Like who cares about personnel turnover? Do all of it. it it's a game that both fan bases are going to be hyped for. Make sure that it's a home game. Now, I understand that there are scheduling issues in certain markets that can't always do a home game. Particularly there, that one market. <laughs> particularly that one market. Um, but like, I mean, my only issue is like I would personally probably wa- rather have it be week three or four, or, or like have yeah. it be a Canada Day game or or something. And play twice. And play twice. <laughs> yeah, I'd like like it. What would have been cool had there been something at stake here because we would have known like it adds to it that these are the two powerhouses going at it. We know how good they are. So like week one sort of takes away from that a little bit, but at the same time, like it guarantees that ever, all the starters are playing. It guarantees that the biggest names, like generally like great cup week is where you make stars in this league. So those guys are generally on the same team. Um, I mean, it does help. I was pretty mad about it. And then I'll be honest with you, like, I looked and I was like, oh yeah, but like BC Winnipeg is, is the week after. So yeah. it, it certainly was like a nice little, little bit of medicine for, for the sickness that we got this game. Because the reality is like, I thought next week we were going to get Calgary Sask, which prior to a week ago, like the Stamps still had something to play for in that game. Yeah. Um, And I thought, okay, well at least that'll be big. But now like the Stamps have just been so awful that they're not really even worth like watching if you're a neutral and writers aren't still, that much better i know but <laughs> like, they're they're two games ahead like so you know i look at the schedule and i'm like okay well where are the other marquee games and this is really it for the rest of the season guys what are you doing tonight i don't know what you're doing tonight you're probably looking for something guys you gotta go check out mike's pub this is probably my favorite pub in the city 1330 15th avenue southwest right in the belt line Honestly, they do it all. I, for years, played trivia on Wednesday nights at Muggs. It's the best trivia night in the city. Other nights, they got music. They got specials every single night. Some of the best food and drink specials in the entire city are at Muggs Pub. You want wine. You want beer. You want cocktails. They got it all. Big fan of their fish and chips. They got some amazing pizza. You want to watch the game? They got TV screens. You want to just have a drink with friends? Perfect spot to do it. You want to have some food? As I said, it's delicious. Muggs Pub. We love having them as a sponsor. We love having them just down the road from us here at our studios. Check out Mugs Pub. They're the best. Dave McIver from 770. Before we go any further, I do like want to like set the stage here because I had a little bit of a, a scheduling snafu, I would say. It's not just that I called you and was like, hey, man, can you save me and come on the pod? That would be one thing if you had said yes. You have a three-week-old baby right now? Is uh, that- she's, about, she's about four weeks four weeks who you were feeding and you were like, yeah, Danny, I'll help you out. Yeah. I know. I I saw like your messages and stuff and I'm like, Oh, I, I, now I feel bad because I didn't respond to any of your messages. You literally had to call me. Let's be clear that I sent you a message was panicked, called you 30 seconds later. So (laughs) uh, um, no, dude, you are saving me in such a big way. And this is a thrill for me because I have been on your show um, countless times. We do 70 minutes prior to every stamps game. We do a little, uh, CFL segment, which is, is one of my highlights of the week. And uh, I've, you know, you're, I've been on your show numerous times. So it's a, it's a thrill to have you. We are on a Stampeders bye week. We are. Um, but what a bye week it is. How are you feeling? I mean, you know me, man. I try and be Mr. Optimistic. Anybody who listens to our station in the morning, you know, up until probably this week, 
I've been Mr. Optimistic. I'm like, here's the path to the playoffs. You know, Saskatchewan's losing. I, like, the Stamps just need to get one win here. And and then if they can string a couple together, like they can get the tie break against Saskatchewan on the 13th of October. And it's a spooky Friday. You know, it's Friday the 13th. Anything can happen. And then this weekend against Hamilton or last weekend against Hamilton happened. And it was like kind of sucked the life out of Mr. Optimistic. Yeah. And like, we're not going to just come on here and just crap on the Stamps. Like that's no. not... That's not sort of either of our MO. Um, but like, I sort of agree. I was going into this weekend being like, I can't believe there's still a shot, but there's still a shot. <laughs> yeah. And Saskatchewan isn't, isn't impressing me. They might lose the rest of their games. Stamps can just, and then it was just the, it was that game against the Ticats felt a little bit to me like I was watching a team that maybe was ready for the season to be over. Yeah, it felt like the air kind of got sucked right out of the season in that game. You know what I'm saying? Like, you could almost see the weight of the season and the losing of close games and the inability to get it done when you really needed to get it done kind of weighing on them. And you could kind of almost see it on the faces of some of the players in the second half. I'm not like questioning effort or hard work or any of that stuff. Never would. Cause you know, those guys are, are putting it on the line every single day. And, but it just kind of felt like, man, it, maybe they can't get it done this year, even though there's still that path. And where I start with this team is 18 players on the six game. And it's where I think like the difference between guys like you and I, who, I mean, admittedly I have relationships on the team. So like, I, I, I like these people. Um, so I am, and I, if people think that makes me a bad journalist, like that's not me saying that I don't hold them accountable. That's not me, me saying that I'm not honest in my assessments, but it is me saying that like when they lose a game or a mistake is made, I, I think that I do have a little bit more empathy for the players as opposed to getting upset and getting angry about it, which is what some fans have done. But, you know, everything else aside, like this is the CFL in a year when it's very hard to bring American talent up. And I have just had trouble moving past this idea that like, what are you supposed to do when Jalen Philpott and Malik Henry and James Waters and how many DBs like at some point you just, you're running out of talent on some level and, uh, and the Canadian guys take time to develop. So, you know, Clark Barnes, he comes in, he looks great. Well, he gets Clark hurt. Barnes gets hurt. Like how many more, like what sort of depth of Canadian receiver can, can these teams even have or can be expected to have? So there's just this level where, I am just not in the place of, of yelling and screaming and calling for people's heads that I think some others are. Um, and that's, that does start with the injuries for me. Yeah. Like, you know, we always use the line. It's not an excuse, but it's a factor. And like, <laughs> you know, I, I talking to people from other markets, like talking to Derek Taylor in Winnipeg, like he's like, the stamps are incredibly injured. Like people in Calgary understand that. Right. Like, you know, like we, we get calls on our post game show that you know, Dave Dickinson needs to lose his job. And it's like Derek Taylor literally laughed out loud at I know. And said we were getting that kind of feedback. He's like, you do know that they've made the playoffs for 17 straight seasons, right? Like there's, there's just, look, it, there's a standard that's been set here, a standard they haven't been able to reach this season because the factor of injuries when you have, you know, let's say 15 out of 18 guys that are going to be regular starters on this team. It's just, it's going to be something that affects you. It's not well, skewed, it's just, just reality. Exactly. And I, and I, I often do like my response to some people is like, okay, let us assume that there is more to a football team than their quarterback. Like, let's just like, let's just, well, <laughs> I know, but like, let's just for one second. So, like ignore the fact that the quarterback's mistakes are the easiest. So I'm not letting you replace Jake next year. That's not what we're saying, but like, what's the problem that you think? And I, I say this to fans, like, what's the problem? Like, what's the, what's the solution? What's the problem? Cause the D line's not bad. I mean, if James Vodders is back and, and looking like he did earlier in the year, I think you're pretty okay there. Um, would you maybe like a little more pressure from the other end? Yeah. But According to PFF, Julian Hauser is like just every game. Amazing. Um, linebackers have been pretty good. I mean, I, I don't, I think some of us would like Mike Alway to cut out the high hits a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. There's obviously been some problems with the DBs, but there's seven or eight of them on the, 
on the sixth game. So, like, that's probably inevitable. Okay, well, the receivers, we all like Markin. We like Reggie. Mm -hmm. We, you know, I, I think we think Odom's Dukes took a step this year. The Mark Ethan Ambles thing was weird, but we we like Jalen Philpot. He just hasn't played. Clark Barnes looks like, so, like, so it's not the receivers. The running back room's been given Excellent. everything. Like, so, like, at some point, it's like, okay, well, cool. They'll go out into free agency. They're going to spend their money differently this year. There's no question. They're going to get some guys, but like, it just sort of doesn't feel to me like this team is that broken. It just feels like some things went wrong. And I think that they lost, like the, the execution hasn't been there. And that is uh, something that they have to fix. They get, they got to figure that out. But I think like probably you want a couple of linemen. If you can, mm -hmm. you'd like to solidify the tackle, but I, I don't, I can't pinpoint, Oh, this is what's wrong with this team. What's the identity of this team? Well, that's a good question. The, what my, my answer would be their inability to win close games. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you go back through the schedule, like you lose two overtime games, one to Saskatchewan, one to Ottawa. You almost lose that game in Saskatchewan where they have, you know, the big Hail Mary. Thank goodness, you know, they get in field because field position and, and Renee Paredes can kick a field goal. They lose 1918 to the Bombers when they're starting Drew Brown at quarterback. Like it's not like the team's been blown out. Right by any means, they were just, they got blown out by BC. Yeah, I think two blowouts, right? Yeah, and then it's weird. Like that Montreal, like what I wrote in my story was, I was like, it sort of felt like it was probably over after the Labor Day rematch. But you, you, you couldn't say it, but like that Montreal game was one where I was like, ah, no, um, that now, didn't feel good. That was a seventeen point loss. But then, like, you're right. Like, in my mind, this Hamilton loss was a blowout, but it was only really 22-15. It was yeah. only a touch. It's a seven-point game, and they had the ball many times to try and get the game tied. Yeah. And I would say that the identity of this team for me, that the thing or the – identity is the wrong word, but the thing that has haunted this team is that when they get in a rut during a game, like, every team has stretches of a game where you're not performing, you're not getting first downs, and they just – those seem to – drag too long they can't seem to they don't have that play that just that breaks them out gets them a little momentum back gets the ball moving you put out Rene paradise kicks a field goal at least like it just seems like those just stretch on and on and on and that for me is sort of the when you have a Bo Levi Mitchell quarterback when you have you know a Zach they they often like produce that little bit of magic and I just don't think the stamps had that this year and that's You're not right. on Jake I just think that like it's literally like Jake was under too much pressure Jake didn't handle that pressure as well as you would like um the receivers had some terrible drops at times so and then the running game you need the passing game to open up the running game so it's like all of it factors it, 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 when you when they get in a rut you're right it's really tough for them to get out the thing i think of is like you haven't been able to get a spark from literally anywhere like if you think about it they haven't have they had a pick six i don't think they've had a pick six have they had a long rushing touchdown like 25 yards or more no, no they haven't had that so it's like that Have one they had a return touchdown. I actually should be able to pull this up relatively. I think easily. they've had two, but they both got called back on penalties. So uh, I would say yeah. no. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, they just they have zero kick return touchdowns. Yeah, it's just there hasn't been. <laughs> I didn't know this. What they did have you zero kick They have zero, so they are tied with Edmonton for last in the league, and then they have given up four, so yeah. they are the worst in the league. So yeah. specials are a part of this too. Absolutely. But there's just been nowhere where you've got like a big spark, like no. no pick sixes, no punt return touchdowns, no 35, 40 yard touchdown runs. And look, the running backs have been really good. Like Diedrich yeah. Mills came in and was like running for a hundred yards every game. It felt like, but when you just don't get a big spark from either side of the ball or your special teams, it just feels like that rut that you're in is just getting deeper and deeper and deeper and tougher to get out of. And that's kind of, you're right. Been, been the biggest issue for them is once they get stuck in a pattern, it's like we can't get out of this pattern, and all we can do is kick field goals with Renee. Do you think they beat the Riders? Who it's doom and gloom in Calgary, but it feels like the cloud has just extended out over the prairies, past Medicine Hat, past Swift Current, and Moose Jaw. I'm just naming places that I know. I don't know any <laughs> other. 
There's one like saltwater lake, I feel like, on that drive. This Too dark cloud lake. has just emerged. Somehow it moved down from Edmonton, even though they have the same record as the Stamps, basically. And Edmonton's now all bright, sunny days and, and, and Trey Ford ahead. But it does feel like <laughs> the Riders and Stamps, this is like, has potential to be this massive game that is like also, like, is it? <laughs> We get a great, we have a great texter named Kirk and he goes, it's just two people trying to give themselves or give each other something and nobody will take it. It's like, you know, you go to the playoffs. It's like, no, no, you go to the playoffs. And it's like, I don't know who's going to win that game, but it's how many times you said this, it's winnable, it's <laughs> right? Like they all have seemed winnable outside of maybe two this year where you're like, hmm, I don't like their chances the way they're playing, but it's winnable. Do I think they're going to win? I don't know. I oh, think it's going to yeah. be a close game. Like, I think it's going to be a close game. Like every game seems like it's going to be a close game, but it just seems like that dark cloud is just so heavy right now. Yeah. It's like, it's not even close. Like it still will presumably, I mean, the, the riders could win this weekend. They've got, they've got Hamilton. I, I think Hamilton probably wins that game based on sort of how those two teams are playing right now, but it's in Sask. If the Riders win this, this game is completely inconsequential. It's not like one of the top five inconsequential sporting events I've ever covered because at one point I did have to cover the Calgary Flames playing the Vancouver Canucks four games in a row at the end of the COVID <laughs> season where neither team could move up or down in the standings and the playoffs had already started. So at an empty rink, we had to just cover four games. But like it has potential to be very inconsequential. Um, but I still think that I got to win that game. Apparently, yeah, Bo, apparently Bo might be back. Like, <laughs> yeah, Bo's practicing all of a sudden. It's like I yeah. think we're gonna see Bo week twenty one. I do, especially if if Hamilton loses that that game in BC or against BC. I can't remember where it is. It's fascinating. I mean, it's weird. Like, it's not a. I mean, the most famous situation probably in football is when Doug Flutie basically started the whole year, and then they put in Rob Johnson at the end, and then they played him in the playoffs. Like, it's not a that situation, but like. Bo getting back in and if starting a playoff game, like at this point, I mean, it's just Matthew Schultz hasn't really done much. Like, who knows? Maybe Bo gets his great redemption story. What a weird ending to the season that would be. Right. He goes like, in Toronto, somehow beats them. All is his a great cup all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. Inevitably playing Winnipeg because the CFL can't do a great cup that isn't <laughs> Winnipeg versus a Southern Ontario <laughs> team. Um, but who is, uh, we got about probably seven minutes here. Who's your MOP right now? Or is it? We had this conversation before. Uh, it's probably Vernon Adams Jr. right now. Okay. But I don't know. It's so, so close between him and Zach. That's just out of the West. I guess that's kind of my West nominee. For me, like I still have Chad Kelly. But, but then, yeah, I was. Chad yeah, I was needs to say. play in these games and win these games. The argument for Chad Kelly is not based on the numbers. The argument for Chad Kelly is based on the Argos have not lost a game that he has started and finished. Yeah. The, like he, they technically have lost one of his starts, but he got hurt. But like the guy has just like, at some point, what more can you do? And the Argos have been up. So have played pretty conservatively in the second half of a bunch of games. So I think his numbers would be a lot better if they hadn't been dominating. Teams. And do you think he's going to play much down the stretch here? Like, I think he'll play a bit, but like, I can't see him outside of this 150th birthday game. I can't see him playing him a whole game. I mean, you, Ted Wyman and I were talking about this a little bit. Um, I, I, I still think you need to keep him sharp. Like, I still think. Oh, you, he's going to play, but is he yeah. going to play an entire game? I doubt it. No, I mean, their schedule, like Edmonton at home, which is just hilarious that that's the 150th game. Um, <laughs> just like sets up perfectly for them. Yeah. And then Ottawa, which they will, they should crush the Red Blocks there, obviously. And then the Riders in Sask, there's no way he's playing that full game. You're not sending him out on October 21st. It's going to be minus 30 and, you know, people cross-country skiing to the stadium. You're not putting Chad Kelly out there for the whole game. And then Ottawa away from home. Yeah, you're probably right. Do you even take him? I mean, it's close, I guess. I don't know how far Ottawa is from Charlie. I like talking about this <laughs> about this with you, but this debate is going to get so stupid by the end of the season. <laughs> oh, I know. Well, because like, they started it in week 16 or 17, whatever it was. Yeah, I mean, I look, I right now, if I had to vote for MLP, it's Chad Kelly for me. And for me, it's not particularly close. It's just like that Argos team, as I said, like they were on track to be historically good if they just, I, I still think they could tie the record for the least losses yeah. in a in a season. I mean, they're, so I've got it. 
they got to acknowledge that. And Chad Kelly has been exceptional in a league where we're constantly asking questions about every single quarterback. We don't ask questions about him. So he's got my MLP right now. It could change from the West. I, I sort of said this to Ted Wyman. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Whoever wins this weekend between BC and Winnipeg, if if Vernon goes out and his lights out, puts up 320, a couple touchdowns, no interceptions, runs the ball a little bit, keeps keeps plays alive, keeps drives alive. It's Vernon for me. Like he's, he, there's, they're so neck and neck that I think like these debates are going to come down a little bit to perception and ultimately a little bit to wins. Right. Yeah. Wrong? Like, no, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong at all. Oh, hello, Marcus. Excuse me here, Danny. While I get rid of this cat. Ah, there we go. I uh, yeah. It's, I love him too, but he's interfering right now. Um, I will yeah. be honest with you. For a second, I thought that that was your four-week-old baby, and I was like, "How is a four-week-old baby she's just very smart crawling all over the place?" Yeah, she's very, very talented. No, super baby. I just think, I think it, it will come down to wins and losses because this tiebreak is so important. This game on Friday is just so important for both teams' seasons. Like, I really like the BC Lions when they play at home. I do, and if they're hosting a home playoff game, like I'm pretty sure I saw somewhere on Twitter today that they're going to start opening up the upper deck seats this week. Like if that team, if that team hosts a West final, like they're receiving cores easily as good as Winnipeg's in my book. Yeah. So like who wouldn't like, I also Ted Wyman and through no fault of his had some connectivity issues. So I'm not sure if this answer is going to get it in the pod, what he said, but he did make the point. I think it's valid that a loss here hurts the lions more than it hurts the bombers because the bombers aren't going to be that upset about going into bc plays and that's the thing too like the bombers they have shown that they know how to win the big game and that's why i think this weekend is so important for me is bc yeah they beat the stampeders last year in the west semi and they've been able to beat teams you know pretty handily this year but this is really a game where all the chips are down both teams are looking for a victory this is a big game probably the biggest game on the cfl schedule of the season it's not even close yeah yeah can they win it and i think the Bombers already know they can win this game, right? Like they've, they've won it. They've won the West final. They beat the stamps. They've, they've yeah. beat, they've beat everybody. So if BC wins this game, does that tell them, okay, we can, we can do it. Like there's always that moment. I think for teams where you have to go over that hump. And I think this one this week, if the BC Lions can beat the Bombers, it'll be like, okay, yeah, we can, we can beat this team. Yeah, and BC's done this. Dominic Grimes was on the sixth game, right? Like, yeah. they're getting a receiver who I have as as maybe my top receiver in the league. Like, I, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm saying maybe. So don't come in okay. and yell. Like, look, on his day, Kenny Lawler's up there. On his day, uh, Eugene Lewis is up there. On his day, Reggie Bagleton. Like, there's a lot of great receivers in this league. But, like, Dominic Grimes, like, they've been doing this without their number one. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that the Lions, like, the O-line I like, the D-line I like. You win football, like we always look back at the end of every Grey Cup and we're like, oh yeah, the team with the best lines won the game, won the won the Grey Cup. Every and year. the Lions, the Lions might be that team right now. So that's why I have a lot of faith in them. I think they are gonna win this game. Um, and I, I just think that like if you are them, man, how you would pivot from a loss here, knowing like, okay, well, now we got to go to Winnipeg in November. It's gonna be freezing. Mike O'Shea is going to be like reading poetry about about (laughs) how beautiful it is to play in minus 30. Meanwhile, everyone else in the stadium is going to be dying. I only say that because Mike O'Shea gave me a very funny answer once where he like waxed lyrical about the beauty of playing in minus 30. And I was like, you're so cool, Mike O'Shea. I like you so much. But like, I don't agree. Never put me in that weather. Speaking from somebody who has to stand on the sidelines in it, and granted, I'm, I can't work up a sweat down there very often. It's not that fun, so I don't know where he's coming from. I know he's a former player, but like, it's not that. It's not that fun. No, <laughs> um, no, it's not. But like you uh, say, the, the Bombers, like, this is just par for the course if they win this game because they've won the West Finals. They've they've done it all that they've they've proved that they can do it. BC hasn't so. That's Except why there I, have been, I think it matters to the bombers because there are so many questions about wh- whether they're the same. Sure. But like mindset for them, you don't think that they think they can go into BC and win a West final. I think that doubt creeps in if you lose this game. Okay. I think you like you've lost to the team twice this year. 
You've lost to the Lions twice. Yeah. You you lost that big Labor Day game. There have been a couple games where you just haven't quite looked like yourself. I still think that if you're there in Winnipeg and you're one of the bombers, you're sitting there and you're like, oh, when playoffs hit and it comes time to get locked in, like, guys, check the record. Check the resume. Flip the switch. Yeah, like, we can flip the switch. But I do think, like, there have to be doubts. There have to be doubts that they're on that same level. And they lost the Grey Cup. Like, it's true. We forget this. Yes. Like, <laughs> um, like and, and they lost the Grey Cup. So I, I actually do think winning a massive game where everyone's eyes are on you, you're not going to have to deal with weeks of question or a week of questions at Grey Cup about or during the West final about the loss. I, I do think that like they could use some just like stability here. Um, and I think that would be important. And then beyond that, I mean, like if, yeah, I, I, I just think, <laughs> I think both teams need a win. I think it's like, it's awesome. Like that's, it's crazy. that's what it comes down to. It's crazy to say with two 11 and four teams that they need a win, but I, I don't disagree with you. I think this is like, as we said, this is the biggest game of the season. It's not even close. It's going to be the biggest game until probably the West and East finals and maybe the biggest game till the great cup. So yeah, the both teams are going to have to win if they, they want to host that game. Pick right now. And this is the last question I'm asking. And then I'm letting you go look after your baby child. Pick your, I don't need the winner, but what's your great cup matchup this year? We're at the point. We're in we're in early October. I can start asking this question. That's tough. Uh Toronto's in for sure, I think. Even though Hamilton is crazy enough to, you know, go on this run down the stretch and then somehow go into Toronto where they always play well and beat them. But I think Toronto's in. Man, I just picked BC to win on Friday night. So I'm gonna say BC because if that game's at home in the West Final, I think BC's gonna get there. So BC Toronto. Love it. Dave Van, you are the best. Thank you. I no worries, pal. can't tell you how much you you saved uh, you saved me here. Um, please go look after your child, guys. Make sure you check up out Dave. Dave, what's your Twitter? Just just give yourself a little shout out here. It's uh, D McIver Q R D M C I V O R Q R on Twitter, and uh, yeah, come check us out there. And then of course, uh, you know, you're looking to listen to a Stampeders game. You're in the car. You're on uh, Q R Calgary 107 and 770, and uh, we do the post game show and the pregame show and uh, the halftime show, and you can even hear Danny Austin on the pregame show. Usually our yeah third segment i believe cfl this week there you go i spit fire if my phone rings because my phone yeah what's wrong with stuff. your couch i don't know we're gonna have to well we'll have another attack <laughs> buddy thank you so much <laughs> no worries pal all right. all right thank you for today mckyber thank you to ted wyman uh thank you to mugs pub thank you to fraser and Fig. thank you to everyone for watching for listening please share it let people know if you like the podcast like subscribe that's it Thank you to everyone. Uh, really, really excited for the games this weekend. Can't wait to talk about them on Sunday, presumably with Ian Busby and anyone else who wants to come on. Thank you guys. Have a good weekend.